Hey, so uh, g'day to the four of you. Uh, you you want to go around the room? I'm Andrew Parsons at Microsoft. Uh, Perrin. Perrin. Justin. 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 Fabio. Fabio and Steve. Steve. Good to meet you guys. Uh, I'm actually, uh, as you can hopefully tell by my accent, I am an Aussie, but I actually live in Seattle. Uh, my wife said she'll divorce me if I lose my accent, so I've got to <laughs> come back occasionally and say g'day, mate, and all that kind of stuff. The yeah, exactly, yeah. So um, I'm going to uh, play a little video first, and then we'll get into uh, what I was going to talk about with you guys. So that's kind of like just setting the stage a little because what, what has been happening um, in the industry for the last year or so is that Microsoft has this thing called Universal Windows Platform, right? We launched it a couple of years back for Windows 10 and people are like, it doesn't perform very well, right? It doesn't have the same performance as like a raw Win32 game or whatever. But all those games I just showed you are all UWP games, right? And that's, that's why that's there. And UWP is, you know, it's, it's really here. Um, this is just a small selection of games that are actually shipped as universal Windows platform games on the Windows Store. Um, and, uh, and so the, the, the progress and the progression of, of what's been happening is, has been really, really exciting. But it wasn't all like that. So when we first launched uh, UWP uh, we've, in 2015, it actually came as part of Windows 10. But on the Xbox, we didn't actually have that set up right. We had the Xbox 10, uh, Windows 10 Core. Um, but we didn't actually have UWP enabled on the console. Now, last year, we actually started doing some convergence work. And in fact, converge is a word that you hear a lot at Microsoft. Uh, and so back, back then, about a year ago, we actually converged the stores so that you as a developer could actually just publish once in, in, uh, in one store and have it available across our ecosystem. Um, in fact, if you look at the UI, it's the same it's, the, it's basically the same experience for a consumer uh, on the Xbox Store as it is on the Windows Store. One has a dark theme versus a light theme, but it's basically the same UI. Uh, and so, uh, but and at the same time, we started enabling Universal Windows Platform on Xbox, but we only did it for apps. And that was because we had this um, difference of app models on the console. There's, there's something called the Exclusive Resource Architecture, ERA, that uh, like the big blockbuster uh, games uh, get access to. Uh, and, and that gives them pretty much exclusive access to all of the CPU and graphics and stuff. And there's the um, shared resource architecture, SRA model, that actually is, uh, only gets about a quarter, well, up until recently only got about a quarter of the CPU, I think one graphics core, that kind of stuff, shared access to the bandwidth. It was kind of, kind of to be honest, a little sucky uh, in terms of, uh, you know, of stuff. And obviously games weren't really going to be hugely performant there. Um, but uh, earlier this year, we actually went a little bit further. We've actually improved how um, UWP performs across the board. Uh, and so on Xbox, we finally um, made that sort of decision to allow UWP games to, to be published. Um, and you'll see that uh, in the future, uh, in fact, the future is now, um, we actually made some even more progress on that. And I'll, I'll get into that in a second. So UWP, you know, up until now, the only, things you, only ways you can get onto the Xbox would be if you were, you know, an Ubisoft or Activision, uh, or you're in the ID at Xbox program, which is a fantastic program. Uh, Chris Charlo, who's the head of that, actually is doing a talk tomorrow here uh, in the Microsoft room. Uh, and so if you want to do a managed program where you actually get, uh, you know, an account manager and uh, technical support and, and, and that kind of stuff, uh, you should definitely go and check his talk out. So what's next? Before I do that, I want to just sort of give you another sort of view of how we look at um, developers uh, who are building 
games across the Microsoft ecosystem, across the, the various platforms, if you will, of what we've got. We've got the classic Win32 development, right? If you want to do that, you can target PCs as, you know, until, the, until the cows come home. Um, but that's kind of where, you, where you're sort of stuck. You're building for that. On the other end of the spectrum, hey, if you wanted to build for Xbox, you had to do it with an XDK. You had to have a dev kit, you had to have an, a managed program. Uh, but then if you did that, even if in the ID and Xbox program, you got access to all of the Xbox Live stack. So you could do sign in and presence all the way through to achievements and multiplayer. Pretty cool. And you could publish to, to the Xbox store there. UWP development um, allows you to actually publish to, to both, but through different programs, right? So if you want to publish a UWP game today um, without doing any Xbox Live, you can publish to all of the whole Windows 10 store, which doesn't just, that's not just PCs, but it's also tablets, it's also uh, mobile, it's also HoloLens and our mixed reality devices. So all of those share the same store, they all share the same code base and core. You can build once, for example, in Unity, you go build for UWP, that's building for every single um, device that, that is a UWP device. Um, if you wanted to build UWP games for Xbox, the, the only way you could do that was with the IDE program until until now, right? So the Xbox Live Creators program is the new thing. It's the shiny, right? It's, it was something we announced uh, at GDC this year, uh, so what, six months ago? Um, but we only made it live only about a month ago, maybe six weeks. Um, it's an open program that any developer can use to build an Xbox Live enabled UWP game for Xbox One and Windows 10. There are two things I want to highlight in that statement, right? First one is, this allows you for the first time at any developer for the first time to publish to Xbox One. You don't have to be in a managed program. You don't have to pass, you know, special certification and, and everything. You can just, you know, get to Xbox One. It doesn't matter who you are. The second one is you can, for the first time, any developer use a set of Xbox Live services to enhance your game. And I'll get into what services you get, what features you get, but it's pretty cool um, to, to do that. So, you know, it comes with a standard store policy. So in the Windows Store, you can actually just uh, submit an app or a game and it has a, a particular set of um, store requirements. They're mainly to make sure you're not doing anything malicious. There's no extra policies in place for Creators Program. It's just all the same stuff. There's no licensing, there's no cost. The only cost is if, you're, if you don't have a Dev Center account already, you have to pay a one-time fee of $20 lifetime um, to get in there, hundred dollars for a, a company, but uh, that's uh, that's right across. That allows you to publish any apps, any games. Uh, it's super easy to configure. It's just straight APIs that are available as an open thing. I think they're actually on GitHub right now. Um, the cool thing about this is because it's open, it's up to you. Just like any other app and game in the Windows Store, in the, in the Microsoft Store, you can publish when you want. You can update when you want. You can change the price when you want. You can put in in-app purchases when you want. It's really up to you how you want to do it, when you want to do it. And then it has this uh, right-sized feature. It doesn't give you all of Xbox Live. There's some things that we lock away for managed partners, but it gives you it gives you a, a, set, a really good subset. So why why is it that I'm talking about this? Right, Xbox Live is is the the fundamental piece to that. To understand why Xbox Live is, is important, uh, it's, it's really cool to dive into some of these things. There's three areas I want to look at. The first one is, you know, reach. Um, and so things like identity and bas basic presence. It's, it's super simple, right? It's, it's something where you think, I just want to be able to log in to Xbox Live on my game, on Windows or Xbox. Um, at, on the surface, you say, well, that's kind of a bit of an overhead, but at the same time, what it means is, it means that every person who's running your game, their activity feed will show that that person's running the game, which means every one of their friends will see that they're playing your game and they can click on that link and go, hey, I haven't heard of that game before, check it out. So it's kind of like a viral reach for you without you doing anything. Um, and so as part of that, you actually get access to APIs to be able to check when someone's playing, who of their who of their friends list actually plays your game as well, and you can actually do some interesting interactions there. Um, and then the last two things I want you know here are basically what I was talking about earlier with UWP on Xbox allows you to give that cross-platform building as well as that converged store. The second one is community, and this is you know just just as cool because we have the mixed 
Mixer Interactive Streaming, um, which I've got a slide on later, but basically in a nutshell, it's Microsoft's Twitch. Um, it's a, but it's, it's got a few advantages over some of those other streaming platforms. Uh, you know, it's got zero, uh, sorry, sub-second latency. It has the ability to do four player uh, co-streams and the interactive part is actually really crucial as well that uh, you can start really doing some interesting gameplay mechanics when you can actually interact with the watchers as well as the players. Uh, game hubs and game, game clubs uh, are really super interesting. Game hubs, every game published with Xbox Live, creators program or, or full Xbox Live, um, gets its own game hub and you can customize that however you like. You can put in you know, news and updates, you can preview the new sort of levels you're gonna be releasing, all that kind of stuff. It's, it's all up to you how you wanna do that. And then clubs are player created. So um, that can be enhanced as well. You can you could create one yourself or you can have how other, other people create uh, clubs. I've seen people create clubs around you know, an aspect of a game, you know, like maybe the level designer of a game so that the people who are creating levels can share stuff with each other. So it's a way of actually using the community to actually further uh, sort of explore and expand uh, the information about you about your game. Party chat is actually a system wide thing within the console, the Xbox One console, and that actually comes free as part of that system wide access that you could leverage off in your game as well. The third area I want to sort of highlight is uh, you know the fact that. Um, we have the, these services that you get access to. And the first one is uh, leaderboards and, and feature statistics. And so with that, you can have, um, you know, but Xbox Live can manage that data for you. So you can, you can highlight some specific uh, stats that you can then showcase to, to all your players. You can have leaderboards uh, so, they can, so they can brag with each other. The game DVR is another way that the uh, Xbox Live um, server actually gives you that sort of extra strength and extra sort of reach because um, you know, people are recording videos all the time, game clips all the time and publishing them out uh, and then uh, you can get uh, people to, other people to fi find them that way. Connected storage is super cool too. You can pick up where you left off uh, with the game uh, because that game is saved in Xbox Live's uh, save management. So you can then access it uh, anywhere or anywhere the player is, is going. And then just like party chat, we also have a lot of accessibility um, uh, that's there. Uh, and so text to speech and speech to text and other things like that are built in and you get, guys get access to that. Okay, I've got four of you left. I better smile some more. So, <laughs> Anyway, so uh, Xbox Live, as I said, it's a kind of like a subset of Xbox Live services that you get in Creator's program for free. Um, you can see it's a pretty good subset. So all of those things I just talked about, Xbox Live sign-in and presence, just that alone is just awesome, right? But then leaderboards, statistics, activity feeds, game hubs and clubs, party chat, all those extra things um, just really make it so that you know, you, you can enhance your game without doing a, a lot of effort and it's all part of that, that open platform. There are some things you get that uh, the managed programs don't get, uh, like the fact that you don't have to sign an NDA and you get to ship when you want to ship. Um, uh, the certification is the standard app, you know, when, uh, Microsoft Store certification, so it's pretty quick. And then the last one there I've, I've sort of put in as a little uh, extra point is the fact that you can just develop with retail hardware, right? So you could just go down to, EB or uh, you know um, JB Hi-Fi, buy an Xbox One console, bring it home, download the dev mode app out of the store, run it, click a button, and now you've got a dev kit, All right? Um, and you can then remote deploy from Visual Studio from your PC. You can actually remote debug, so you can be running the game on the console and actually uh, you know, checking it out in Visual Studio back on your PC, so that's pretty good. There are some things you don't get, and there's a couple of big ones there uh, that I want to highlight. Um, achievements and, and gamer score and multiplayer. Both of those things are uh, a significant investment on Microsoft's part and so we've kept those to the managed programs um, partners. Um, and if you do want those, you can always go to the ID at Xbox program. You can always, and, and the cool thing about creators program and ID is that they're not mutually exclusive. So you can be in the ID program and be creating uh, creators program games on the side. Um, like let's say you've got a game with ID and it's gonna take you two years. You wanna 
whip up a really quick puzzle game or something, you can do that and create this program and just get it out there as an example. You can also upgrade your game to be an ID game. So you might first release it um, as a creator's program because you can get it out really fast. You can you know, fine tune it and get it to that point. And you go, okay, now I'm at that point where I want to implement um, you know, achievements. Well, then you can apply to ID. You can show the, the creator's program version of it and then work with them to, to implement that stuff. The multiplayer I want to highlight as well because that is, there's a little finesse in there. If you're on Windows, you can build your own multiplayer. No problem. It's, this is just the Xbox Live multiplayer is not available to you. Um, on the Xbox, the only way you can do online multiplayer on Xbox is through Xbox Live. Um, so you can't actually do multiplayer without being in the managed programs. You can do same screen, like couch play multiplayer. Um, no problem. It's just if you're doing online multiplayer, you can't. So when we go back to our multiple paths of success here, we now have this extra one, creator's program, that allows you, any of you, to actually build a game uh, and publish to both Windows and Xbox. So it's pretty cool. So that's, that's just one thing we've done this year. Um, and so there's other things as well. Xbox Play Anywhere came out late last year to allow um, you know, a cross-platform purchase and play as well. Uh, Xbox Live has been slowly improving. We've had, we have over 55 million gamers uh, every month logging in, so that's pretty pretty cool. Windows Sonic is an interesting uh, beast as well. It's our new spatial sound APIs, and so what what's really cool about all of these things is it's this this sense of convergence, right? This theme of convergence. With this one, we learned a lot of stuff when we did Hololens, right? When you do VR. Audio is, audio is crucial, right? If you don't have the audio right, people are not going to really gel with what, you, what you've got. The, the immersion sort of gets a little lost. It's even more that when you do augmented reality and they can see everything around them still, right? <laughs> so you have to get that, that spatial audio just right um, for everything. Uh, and so we learned a lot of stuff when we, did, when, when we did HoloLens. And so we've then wrapped up those um, mechanics for sound into a new set of APIs called Windows Sonic. We worked with Dolby to actually make sure it's going to, you know, take the latest sort of Atmos stuff. Um, but it actually works on headphones, speakers, TVs, um, and actually gives you a much more immersive experience with the audio, um, regardless of what kind of device you're using. Yeah, so it's, that's what is actually wind up in the occlusive headsets. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, streaming install uh, for very large apps or games. Usually, it comes down to games. Uh, you can ha now. You know, in implement this uh, streaming install to be able to start the, the process, let the players actually start playing before it actually is fully complete. Mixer, again, I'll go into a little slide on that uh, in a bit. Uh, game mode uh, is this really cool feature that allows you to get more exclusive access to, to the resources of the device that you're playing on. And then just various Windows updates. Uh, so that video I just showed, that was to celebrate last, just last week to celebrate the launch of uh, Windows uh, 10 for creators update. That's the next big update that we just did. Um, and that has a number of features in it that help uh, improve performance, even from a, uh, from a development perspective uh, in Visual Studio itself. There's a, there's a number of improvements there. So let me look at game mode uh, as, as my next sort of uh, area. Game mode has a few different flavors in it. Um, the first one is uh, for the PC. Um, and basically it allows, it's, it's built into Windows 10 and it allows um, the device to know, the operating system to know that the running app is a game and to give it as much resources as it can. Okay, so uh, it does that with um, uh, both CPU and GPU exclusive uh, resource uh, availability. Uh, and so it basically partitions out the, CP, the CPUs uh, cores um, and then also increases the utilization in, in both. What, what that means is um, you, you as, a, as a game developer can actually take advantage of that and you can then also interrogate it um, in APIs and then act accordingly. There's two ways that game mode is enabled in the Windows 10 um, operating system. The first one is the user does it themselves. That is hit the Windows key G, bring up the game bar, and there's an option there to actually uh, use game mode. That then just will give the, the the app when it has focus or that resource there. 
you haven't done anything special, so you'll just get a little bit of imp performance improvement because you're not taking advantage of that, that knowledge. Um, but you can do it to anything. In fact, my notepad runs really, really fast, right? Because I've got it in game mode. Um, the, the cool stuff is when you start doing it yourself, when you actually manually set it in the app manifest to say, hey, my game has expanded resources or I need access to expanded resources. So you're telling the operating system, you're telling the store that, hey, I, I'm going to need my, my game stuff if I can get it. Then you can start interrogating it, right? So you can say in this little bit of sample code, what I'm basically doing is asking how many um, exclusive cores I've got. And it's going to give me two, two uh, p bits of information here. One, I am in game mode and I'm, I am getting exclusive cores. And two, how many cores am I getting? And so then I can say in this example, if I have three or more cores dedicated to my game, I'll do some you know, extra fancy graphics processing. Right? If I don't have that many cores, then I, I can't rely on that performance, so I'm going to drop down and you know, maybe not do the anti-aliasing or, or whatever. So it gives you that ability to start really doing some really cool stuff without it chugging on lower spec machines or machines that don't actually have the full, the full range of stuff. The, the newer part, we, so we did that, the Windows 10 stuff, earlier this year uh, in Creators Update. But with four Creators Update, we actually did the same thing on Xbox. And this is where it re becomes really cool for you guys, because UWP now, actually on the console, has a lot more resources. And my colleague who wrote this slide for me was like, more, more, more. I'm going, you don't think that's too much? He goes, well, you know, like we went for like one core to 85% of all available resources. I think I want to say more, more, more. Like, so it's, it's a huge increase. It's not 100%, um, but you, as I said, it's about 85% of the full utilization on the console. Now, a lot more games that are UWP games are going to be performing you know, really, really well on the console. One of the first um, uh, games that shipped as a UWP game was Fallout Shelter, um, and they saw a significant increase, uh, something from like 25 frames a second or 32 frames a second or something. Um, don't quote me on that. Delete that out of the video. Um, but it was, a, it was a significant increase in frame rate. Um, without them doing anything, we just turned it on and, and that happened. So Mixer is this interactive streaming uh, ability uh, functionality we have built in uh, right across our ecosystem. Um, it's sub-second latency, which is like, you know, kills the industry standards of like 10 second sort of latency, you know, in, in their sleep. Um, and it has this interaction, right? And, and what I might mean by interaction is not just, uh, you know, a, a player could see what the watches are saying, all kind of stuff, but your game can actually interact with both the player and, and the watches based on what's going on. So think Hunger Games style, right? The player is having a, a tough time with a boss and the watches like vote in some, some power up. Right? And then your game actually loads that power up, the, the, the player actually gets to, to beat the boss. Right? Or conversely, you make it harder. Right? Um, and so it's up to you how you interact with the, the watches on that, that scale, um, but, you, but you have that ability. Right? You, you, you can actually, with APIs, be able to interrogate what's happening in the watcher stream and actually have an interaction going back and forth. You can run polls and all, all kinds of stuff. You can do four-player co-streaming as well, um, and it's basically just native uh, streaming right across um, uh, the Windows 10 and X Xbox One uh, devices. So looking at all that stuff, we can see that it basically uh, covers all this, this whole range of different improvements we've been making. Now some of those things are available on for Win32 devs, right? So if you're still going to be hard baked and, and, and do a, a straight desktop game and you don't want to look at UWP, Game Mode, Mixer and, and Windows Sonic are still available to you, right? Um, if you're building uh, in XDK, uh, uh, Windows Sonic is available to you, streaming installs available to you, other, other those, some of those other things are, but only UWP gives you access to all that stuff that I just talked about. So it's, it's part of our, our commitment to not just converging everything, but making sure that uh, UWP, the universal Windows platform, really is the universal Windows platform. So that's great, right? We, so there's this, this universal development experience. There's, a, there's a lot, lots of performance improvements and, and enhancements there. 
but what about you know getting your game out there to the consumers, right? And so I just want to change course a little bit here and talk about the store for a minute. Um, oh, and I just noticed it just changed like last week to be called the Microsoft Store, not the Windows Store. So if I have titles like that, that's uh, only a late change. Um, but we have we had features and functionality on both the Windows Store and the Xbox uh, Store, and we've sort of converged those together in this one developer portal. So one developer portal means one single payout method. It means one single experience for you as a developer. It also can mean one single experience for the consumer as well. It means that when you submit a game into the de developer center and say, I want to publish this game, check boxes. I want it on Windows 10. I want it on Xbox. I want it on HoloLens. Tick, tick, tick. Okay, I'm done, right? It's, it's this converged experience. When we look at Windows alone, I'm not looking at Xbox right now, this is just Windows alone, we have over 500 million visits to the store every month. Like that's a, that's a big number, right? We have about 550 million devices out there running Windows 10. Uh, and so we have you know, almost all of them on average visit the store once, once a month. Um, it goes across the entire globe, right? We have over 200 countries that have the store available, um, and, but you get to choose where you publish your game. So if you wanna leave the Kiwis out in the cold, go for it. I'm not gonna stop you, right? Or, well, you know, as you can see in the last point there, you could actually just charge them more. There's, there's some stuff that we've actually just added to the, the store. We had some stuff that we added just for our own use, and now we've actually expanded it out and let, it, let everyone use it. Um, and a lot of these things are really tailored for games versus apps. So, for example, you can have a hero uh, trailer that plays in Astroneer, that, that top area there, that actually would auto play as a trailer um, uh, in the store. Uh, but you can have up to 15 trailers now as well. So you couldn't have any trails earlier, but now we're actually really just opening the floodgates and letting you have a, quite a few there. You can have a promo hero image as well. So if you don't want to have a trailer there, you can just have it as an, in an image like you, you can see there in the Astroneer uh, thing. And the, the logos are now bigger, so you can have a bit more artwork, a bit more creativity there. Your screenshots and your video can actually be, done, be uh, recorded in up to 4K. So you can really showcase uh, your game at, at its best uh, for, for your pr prospective uh, consumers. You can um, build groups of consumers so based on, on particular predefined things. So you can have demographics, so you can say, you know, based on gender, rec location, age, um, but you can also segment them on other things as well. As you can see there, you know, can segment them on total store spend. You don't get access to everyone's. You wouldn't be able to see that I've spent, you know, $400. But you could say, hey, anyone who's spent more than $300, I want to segment them out, right? Because I want to target them. They're going to be a, a key target. Uh, same with acquisition date, right? You can see when people have actually bought things. Not Again, not individuals, but as groups, you can actually target that. And there's, and there's heaps. There's a, I had a couple of slides in here that I took out that uh, just, it's just a list of all these different segment groups that you can have. What you can do with those segment groups is then you can actually start targeting things. And so you can um, create that uh, special offer in the Dev Center dashboard alongside all your other sort of information for your game. Um, and then you can then just use a couple of lines of code to do an in-app sort of purchase or in a sort of ad, um, and then target that to a particular segment that you've defined. And you can see that it might just pop up as a you know, super deal from Dreams Defender. Um, and you can see that it might look different on the Xbox versus the PC, but in both cases you can actually pop, have those pop up as, uh, as notifications uh, for the gamer who has your game. So you can then actively promote any sort of new deals. You know, hey, I've got this new DLC. I want all my, all my players to know about it so that I can encourage them to buy it. You can do that. I love the sales options in the, the Microsoft Store. It, it just has this um, power and flexibility that allows you to do some really cool stuff. For example, you can have an initial promotional price. So you can have a price across a weekend. 
you know, can see here, I've got a, an example here, for one day only, I'm gonna give my game away for free. Um, and that's to everyone. But I could actually change that. You can see there, there's a little thing that's 242 markets. I could actually change that to be, you know, just for Australia or just for, you know, India or whatever. And so you can, you can make it free, you can make it discounted, um, you can do all kinds of stuff. But one thing I love about this stuff is that's that second last statement, the offer a discount to owners of your other titles. That, this is where things get really interesting for game developers particularly, um, because we all have games that we built two years ago, three years ago that are not re-monetizing. Um, and so, you know, th th just people aren't gonna buy those games just off, you know, off the top of their head. But if you have an offer for your new game and say, if you own any of my old games, I'll give you a 10% discount on my new game, that's an incentive for them to go back and look at those older games, right? Or you can do the, do the reverse, right? You can say, buy my new game and you get a 50% discount of my back catalog, right? And these are people who won't, wouldn't normally buy it anyway, but they've got that Steam store mentality type thing of, you know, hey, there's a sale going on, I, I wanna be part of that. So you can actually make that happen for, you, for your game. Um, now, you may be saying, oh, but I do have some older games, but they're not in the Windows Store. I don't want to put too much effort into that. We have this thing called Desktop Bridge that allows you to take a Win32 game, wrap it in a UWP layer, and put it into the Microsoft Store. So you can take an older game, just take it as is, and usually, um, about 80% of the time, it actually just works. And there's a, a few little niggles sometimes, but usually that'll actually just work. You've got to put it in the store. All of a sudden, you've got your back catalog there. Then you get your new game out, do the cross-promotional discounting, and you know, you're away. You can do percentage discounts. You can do currency discounts. You can sail, do the sales in just particular regions. Um, you can do uh, midnight launches. You can actually say, hey, I want to do, release my new game or my, the new version of my game midnight everywhere around the world. We've actually seen people do that and have, you know, obviously comes out of New Zealand first, then Australia, et cetera. And we've had people in the US change their time zones on their PCs so they could actually download it when it comes out in New Zealand. All right, so imagine having that for your game. That'd be pretty cool, that, that kind of buzz. What's cool also about this is this is what, they, what a consumer will see, right? It's not just, you know, hey, they just see it's five bucks right now. They'll see that it normally is $20, but for, you know, this amount of time, it's this percent discount or this many dollars discount, and here's the price they're getting. So they'll see that strike through pricing, and that actually also motivates them to actually be more, more considerate in buying that, that product because they, they see they're getting it for a sale. So this is what I was talking about with the, the, the scheduling. You can actually set that exact time uh, that customers are gonna see uh, your game and get your game and you can define that different sh schedule for different markets. So you can say, hey, midnight launch everywhere or you can say midnight launch everywhere except you know, France, and they get it you know, another day or something because you're not ready for that localized version or something. We have um, near real-time analytics in the store as well. It's, it's pretty close. So what that means is when you combine this with the ability to do things like flighting and um, alpha uh, A-B testing that you can do in the store, you can then analyze whether something actually is working. So what do I mean by, by that flighting and A-B testing? There's a couple of different things you can do. The first one is flighting. You can, you can have a particular segment, a, a group of people that you've allocated to be, say, your beta testers, right? And so they're individual people. So, you know, you've, you've created your game and I'm one of your beta testers. So when you release this next version, you release it just to your beta testers, I would get it, right? That's, that's a very specific target. But the other way is this phased rollout approach. Now let's say it's a bug that you're trying to fix, not, a, not an actually new sort of feature. And with a bug, you're trying to actually, you're not exactly sure where it is. You think you fixed it, you know, but you're not, it's, it's one of those weird ones, right? Um, and so you can do this phased rollout and say, just give this version to 10% of my user base, right? And then the store will actually pick the 10%, so you're not gonna have bias, you're not gonna have a, you know, a, a particular focus on people that you know and all kind of stuff. They'll just roll, the store will just roll it out to 10% of your users. And you, because you get this analytics, you can actually then check to see you know, crash reports and other bits and pieces so you can see, okay, this new version, that 10% of people are actually seeing less crash count, right? Or less you know, problems at this point in the game. 
yeah, cool. Roll it out to 20% of my users now or 50% and then ultimately, yeah, release it, right? And that gives you that ability to, to really check uh, with A-B testing whether something's actually working um, before you get it out there. But the analytics obviously goes further than just crash reports. It gives you the you know, acquisition by channel um, and regional breakdowns. You get to see um, you know, where things are. You can see that funnel there where people are like visiting your page, checking it out, getting to that point where they want to buy it or download it and, you know, and ultimately, ultimately buying um, and uh, playing it. Um, just as importantly as the actual technical analytics side, you want to also get um, feedback from from your customers as well. And so the, the store has that, that review ability like most stores do. You can respond to reviews, but you can also have this sort of insight um, where you can actually see sort of groups of, of common sort of themes that uh, your, your reviewers are saying about your game. So here, you know, the big chunk here is stability. The next biggest one is look and feel. Third one is uh, usability. Uh, and so you'll see that kind of information at a, at a real high level glance that you can then sort of take an action of and then maybe di dive into a little bit deeper. Um, you can see there that um, we also do automatic translation of reviews. So if a review is done in a different language, you can actually see it translated into uh, your preferred language. Um, and then you can also filter it based on, you know, the OS. So you can actually see what the Xbox ones are doing versus the PC ones, for example, uh, or, you know, Australia versus New Zealand. So I've raced through all that stuff pretty quickly. Um, uh, but uh, I just wanted to sort of make sure you guys had some time just to chat. Um, tomorrow we've got uh, four talks uh, in 205, which is just across the hallway here, um, sort of like on the, on the other side. Um, these guys are all pretty amazing people um, to, to listen to. Rocky uh, is one of the um, local uh, HoloLens and mixed reality uh, uh, evangelists, basically. Um, and, uh, and so he's come, he's come down to, to deliver that, that talk about diving into HoloLens, building, you know, using tools like Unity um, to actually create really cool uh, v, uh, VR and MR experiences. Simon is a, is a local guy here in Melbourne and he's going to talk to you about the Azure game services and some of the, the features we're actually implementing into Azure and the cloud to allow you to sort of offload a lot of processing uh, up there and let, and let the cloud do, do work for you. And then Chris Charla, hopefully you know that name. He's the head of ID at Xbox and he's, uh, he's coming over. Um, we were lucky enough to be able to nab him tomorrow to talk about ID at Xbox. And then David Barella, super smart guy, um, very technical. Uh, and so that's our technical sort of deep dive into blockchain and how you can use blockchain for gaming. So it's a, it's a, it's a pretty sort of wide swath of, of technical versus, you know, high level. Um, but I think uh, all of those things are really worth uh, checking out. Um, on top of that, if you want to learn more, there's a few other things I wanted to highlight. Um, Xbox Live Creators Program, obviously I talked a lot about that um, in the first part of the talk. And so check out that URL, aka.ms slash XBLCP, Xbox Live Creators Program. Um, and uh, uh, the other one there is the uh, dev center. Dev.windows.com is your portal to everything Universal Windows Platform, Microsoft Store, and it's a great starting point. And in fact, I've highlighted one particular link, which is that first one, the game development docs. If you go to that game development guide URL, that's actually in dev.windows.com. It's just a deep link into there. And that's a it's a web page. You can actually download a PDF version that's about 44, 44 45 pages long um, that uh, uh, goes through game development from prototyping and concepting all the way through to post-publishing, analytics, and all that kind of stuff, and everything in between, en the engineering, testing, um, how to implement Creators Program, how to implement Mixer, how to implement Azure, uh, and all those other bits and pieces that I talked about are all in there. Um, and even though it's that long, it's really just a starting point for everything else. So you might have Mixer, there might be like four links, right? And like a one line, this is what Mixer is, and then check these things out. And there'll be talks, tutorials, white papers, um, and other bits and pieces that will actually really be able to help you develop that stuff. If you want to go a little more deep into some of those things I talked about, Game Mode, there was a fantastic talk at GDC around that. 
um, and about the technical aspects of how game mode works. And the Windows Store um, uh, GDC talk was really good in, t in terms of diving into the analytics and, uh, and stuff were there. Last week we did uh, uh, Windows Developer Day over in London. It's one, something we do twice a year. Um, and uh, we talked about just the various features in Windows in general and some of those improvements. It's about a 10 minute piece in that, um, uh, around about two thirds of the way through uh, around game development and some of the improvements we've made. So if you want to look at some of the actual specific improvements we've done, you know, like say in Visual Studio and stuff, you can actually check that out. The last thing I want to do is uh, really uh, encourage you to check out Dream Build Play. Uh, Dream Build Play is both a contest and a community. Uh, and so I don't know if any of you were around for the old days of Dream Build Play. Yeah, you were? X and A. All the way, baby. All the way. So, uh, dr what's that? It's a long time ago. Yeah. Well, Dream this is how long ago it was, right? Dream Build Play ran for five years. The last time it ran was five years ago. <laughs> Right, so I've brought it back. Dream Build Play is now back this year. Um, we have over two hundred thirty thousand dollars US. So as I was saying yesterday, I think that works out to be what about a million dollars Australian right now? No, it's it's, it's a significant amount of money, um, and it's divided into four categories. We've got um, uh, PC, Xbox, mixed reality, and Azure. So games that use Azure as their back end. They're all UWP categories, so you have to build your game in UWP, but hopefully that, that's going to be pretty straightforward for you. Um, and, uh, and submissions close at the end of the year, December 31st. So if you haven't started, that's fine. You've got, you got some time. Hopefully you've got a game that you could sort of maybe port, looking at you, um, and, uh, and get in there. The other part is the community part. And what I love about the community part is it's something new. It, it's something new that kind of grew out of the original Dream Build Play. We, we had this sort of matchmaking ability in the original Dream of Play that allowed people to just look for other people to, to connect with. We've taken that and grown it up. All right? And so when you go to Dream of Play, um, you can sign up for the contest. We have about, I think it's three and a half thousand developers worldwide have actually signed up for the contest. We, you know, won't be that many who, who submit, but we've got that many signed up. Then the community itself, what you can do is you can create a profile, a public profile with you know, a photo, what country you're from, a little description about you, but three key bits of information. One, different ways people can connect with you, right? And yeah, it's got the standard ones, Twitter, Facebook, um, LinkedIn, email, but it's also got Discord, um, Deviant, uh, like all the different things that you might use in the gaming industry as a, as a connection point. They're all available for you to add, actually add there. The second bit of information is what skills you have. Do you have Unity? Do you have Visual, uh, Visual Studio? Do you have C Sharp? Do you have Android development? I don't care what you do. Um, that's one of, the, one of my requirements when we built this out was it needed to be completely open. So if you're an iOS developer and that's what you put, want to put on there, go for it, right? And then the third one is all the games you've built. Not just necessarily a game you're building for Dream Build Play as a contest, but every other game. And the reason for that is because of that connection, right? Because let's say you guys are building a game and you want an audio engineer. So you can go in that community, filter that down just by audio engineering as a skill. Check out the half dozen, dozen people that are in there that have got that skill. Check out the games they've worked on and go, oh yeah, I like that guy's audio quality. And he also does Unity and you know, some other technology that we're working with. So I, we, we have a little bit more confidence that he might actually be able to sync with us as a team and then use those social connections to be able to connect with him and then you know, and maybe join a team together. So that's kind of what we've done there. We've sort of just taken it a little bit further and um, it's certainly worth doing. Of those three and a half thousand odd people who have actually registered on Dreamville Play, just hit, just hit 600 of them have actually uh, created profiles and there's about 150 games in there as well. Um, so I think of the 150, there's like five of them are actually Dreamville Play games because everyone's waiting until December to, to put, in, put in their entries. So just wanted to highlight that. It's, it's a hugely um, awesome program as far as I'm concerned, um, mainly because I created it um, this year. So yeah, it's good. Um, anyway, uh, that's all I got. So I just wanted to um, give you guys some time for questions and stuff. And uh, hopefully that's good. Cool.
Well, so you can have, what, 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 what are you looking for? So, it's, so for example, if I've got, if I build a game in Unity, uh, I can get analytics from Unity itself. Yeah. Um, can I also get more analytics from uh, yeah, you're, releasing the wrapper as well? Yeah, you'll get, you'll get all, the, all the analytics from things like crash reports and stuff. Yep. Um, and when a, cra when a crash report happens, um, if the user actually enabled the dump as well, you'll get the dump. Um, and you'll get, um, you can actually build into the, your game particular analytics APIs as well, so you can actually publish things out so you know, hey, they've done this particular level or, you know, they've, they've hit this particular point in the game, so, I, so you can track that sort of progress as well. Beautiful. Yeah. 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 And we noticed just the other day, I was sketching some pieces on Facebook, it's like, hey, it's on there. It's like, oh, it's working. Oh, don't stop the mobile game. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, all that stuff is available. Like, so in-app purchases, free-to-play ads, all fully supported and all active, right? And so to give you an idea of that, we actually have a page that I can never remember the URL for. Um, but it basically gives you a breakdown of the store, right? Not a, not a detailed, like, here's the actual dollar figures, but it gives you a breakdown of saying, okay, 90% um, of all revenue in the store comes from games, right? The other 10% is all apps and things like Photoshop and, and you know, Quicken and whatever. 90% is games. Of that 90%, 80-something percent is in-app purchases, <laughs> right? So, and we have a, we have a significant amount of money goes through, you know, like the premium games, like, you know, we sell Forza and Gears of War through, you know, the Windows Store. Um, so that just gives you a, a little sense of just how much money has been going through the in-app purchase sort of, and the ad, ad sort of models. Yeah, really interesting because, you know, as a platform always like been long ago like that, the burden is hard to get revenue. Yeah. Yeah, we, so it's, it's a bit of a double-edged sword though, right? Because for us, um, uh, the, the Microsoft, the Windows Store sort of grew up from the phone, the Windows Phone Store. That's where we first started doing stuff. Obviously, phone, we don't really talk about much anymore because we're really focused on the desktop and on the Xbox. Um, but that's kind of its origins. And because of that, a lot of developers in the early days came across as mobile developers. And so we have a lot of games in the store that are that sort of mobile thing. We also have the, the top down, all the premiums, like we, we push all of our first party tiles in there. Uh, and then we have, you know, some of the bigger ID, uh, indie guys are coming in in that way as well. And so it's kind of this really interesting, you've got gears next to, you know, Gems of War and, yeah, uh, and others. So um, it's an interesting sort of mix right now. Um, and we get questions on both sides. You know, like, hey, my little game's not getting the same focus as Forza does. And then, you know, I'm not going to put my game on there. I don't want it next to a match three game. So it's, it's, uh, it's an interesting uh, dilemma we have there. But it's all, it's all available. And as I said earlier, you know, over 500 million visits to the store. We're getting people into the, into the shopping center. We just need you guys to do something really cool there so they buy it, you know. Um, and, uh, you know, free to play works really well. Um, and, and also remember the demographics, right? Because Every single Windows 10 machine has the store on by default. It's on the taskbar, so it's really easy to use. It's not like Steam where you have to download a client. Um, Steam, you're going to have dedicated gamers. Windows Store, you're going to have Windows users, right? So they maybe not be dedicated like, like someone else on, on Steam. But that also means games like mobile games work, work well, right? Because they're people who... The, the only place they play games is on their phone, and now they've found that same game or a similar game on, on the PC, they're going to be pretty happy with that. Yeah, you're more a congregate sort of game rather than a Steam yeah, game. Yeah. The fact that, um, like I said, the store is, is there front and center, and, and everyone uses, uses Windows 10 because it's downloaded. Yeah. Down, whoever playing, you know, they're, they're downloading some card games. 
Exactly, yeah. Yep. Yep. Cool. Um, I just to ask a yes, yes, Arrigo. Oh, wow. What, what talk was that one that got all that applause? Yeah, probably. Go on. Yeah. So, yeah, that's, that's true. So, you know, like I said before, you know, hey, you can just check boxes and say, I want my game to run in HoloLens and mixed reality. If you do it that way, and you just have the same code base and you don't do any customizations for, for virtual reality, it'll be like, it'll just like be placed on a wall. So it'll just be like playing a window yeah. on, your, on your PC. So there's no, there's no real big difference there. Um, but the, the cool thing is, then you've got the starting point for your virtual reality version of that game. Then you can start playing with it and doing different cameras and figuring out how you want to actually make the interface work differently in a virtual reality or augmented reality sort of experience. But you, you know, rather than doing all of that at once and going, okay, now I'm gonna start here and I'm gonna do all this, this gives you that kind of like a stepping stone. So get it into HoloLens first, see how it looks and go, okay, this is, here's what I wanna do differently, right? And it may be really simple differently, you know? So a great video yesterday in the Unity keynote where they actually had um, an augmented reality game that was just being played on the back of a cereal box Right? But it's just a standard platformer game right? that you might have created in Unity and run on Windows and Xbox, and then they've overlaid it on the back of a cereal box um, in a virtual reality sort of environment. So it, there's different things. There, yeah. I'm done, right? All right. Thank you. That sounded almost as loud as them.